is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Travelers, Season 1, Episode 2, Protocol 6. In this episode, so apparently dark matter is a thing that we are going to be able to use to make weapons. And there was going to be a real bad explosion that our scrappy band has been sent to keep from happening. I feel like between that and the mass shooter whom they stopped, there's been a lot of tragedies avoided. And I'm wondering how many things are on their mission. It seems like this one was completed and they're done but I don't see them being recalled. And what do they ever get recalled? What happened? I have so many questions about how this works. I'm just saying logistics. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Huge thank you to Michael for commissioning this next episode. Um, I am really... So the last episode of Travelers was about a month and a half ago. Um, I re-watched it before watching this one this time around, just so that I could be a little bit refreshed. And I'm glad I did, because there were a few little details that I'd kind of forgotten about. Um, but... This episode really deals a lot more with like what it's like for the travelers to be doing what they're doing when they don't have experience. And it's really kind of fascinating to me that I have been sort of assuming the travelers can go in and out of bodies, that they'll finish up something then they'll leave and go back to their own time. And then they will come back again to somebody else's body to do some other mission. And I'm realizing that that is not necessarily doable, but I had just taken for granted that they could pop in and out of different bodies. Like they were putting on a pair of gloves and Honestly, what, like, uh, if I were going to follow that premise, I then have to ask, well, what does it look like when a traveler leaves somebody's body? Does it just look like a heart attack? Does it look like just brain functions simply ceased for no apparent reason? Like, that is really, really interesting to me for some reason. And also... If you were able to go into another body, like, would you have, like, would it be a period of adjustment trying to do that after having been in a different body? If you can't come back out again, if you're in that body until something happens to it, what happens to you, your consciousness, if you die in that body? Are you just dead or does your consciousness somehow automatically get backed up on a cloud somewhere and you've been like uploaded into this body, but you are still out there and can be used again? And does that mean that in their present, these consciousnesses belong to people who are technically dead? Like, If you leave your own body for another body, does that mean that you have left your body and as in that body is now deceased? Is that body being kept on like life support somewhere so that you can come back to it? And if you can't come back to it, does volunteering for this sort of mission equal basically a death sentence in your own time? You're basically agreeing to leave where you live and go on a mission from which you will not return. I wouldn't think that's the case, but 
if there has been a, like a complete meltdown of, of humanity, if, if things have gone so badly wrong that they are willing to resort to these kinds of measures in the first place, I could see people being willing to volunteer for stuff like this, even if it meant that they were going to die in the present. Um, so anyway, I just like, it really struck me when I was watching this, that I had taken for granted so many different, like, you know, uh, little details about how this would work. And I didn't even really stop to ask myself whether that's even true or something that they would want or possible or what, because there is so much that is still unknown about how this all functions. And there are a couple of little things that happen throughout this episode that really point to the fact that they don't always get this right. So, all right, let's start things off. The previous episode was when we first meet um, most of the travelers and they are being, you know, projected into the bodies of people who are on the verge of death um, just before they actually die. And, you know, we find out and it makes sense that if something has happened to a person who is going to die at natural causes, like there is no way that they can project into that body because you can't just pop into a body and then will it to stop having a heart attack. You have to pick a body that is about to die from some sort of outside cause that is preventable in some way. And that really limits you know, when, when there's this whole concept of like, who, who can we pop in and out of when you hear all oh, somebody who is about to die, that seems like a vast number, but when you pare it down by that and it's not natural causes anymore, then it really shrinks the pool. Um, Michael says, I wish I had rewatched it too, because I'm not sure what I could clarify without expectation spoilers. I like that expectation spoilers. Well, don't worry about it. Don't clarify anything. We'll just go on and, uh, We'll see how I do. Um, so this episode begins like precisely where the last episode ended, where we have all of uh, the crew finally together. It turns out that the FBI agent had been like they had been waiting on him to almost die so that he could become a traveler also. And uh, he was going to die falling down an elevator shaft. And then they are able to swoop in and scoop him up. And he is talking to them about how things are going um, and whether or not they're adjusting. And it turns out like this is new to him. It's really telling how much our sort of biases come into play as we watch this and assume that the oldest, whitest man in the room is the one in charge. But then we find out he has not done this before and does not necessarily know what he's doing. He has this confidence and this like sort of mannerism to him that leads you to think he 100% has this under control. But that's not the case. And I found it sort of uh, revealing that I assumed all kinds of things about him being the one that is, you know, and and technically he is the one in charge. Like he's the person they all are turning to and saying, you know, you have to figure this out. But like, I'm, when I hear in charge, I'm assuming it's somebody that has been placed there because of experience, you know, and the fact that he doesn't have experience makes me think they can't like that. The travelers can't do this more than once. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and there is a a moment where, and I wish I had these characters' names in front of me. Um, and Michael, if you're in the chat and you can help me out here, the FBI agent, we've got the uh, boxer high school kid, we've got the girl who had previously been uh, mentally disabled, and we have the black woman who had almost got beat to death by her boyfriend slash husband, I'm not sure. Um, am I forgetting anybody? I feel like it's everybody at the moment. The girl who's the doctor, really, in her own time, she is administering some sort of shot behind his ear 
And I don't know what this is. Um, uh, like, I'm curious about, like, if that's supposed to be a sedative or if it's supposed to be something that, like, helps with the adjustment to the new body or what. Um, and she's telling him that the intel on her host was way off the mark. And he says something like, we all knew assuming the lives of people from another century wasn't going to be a walk in the park. And he says it in a way that's like really authoritative. Again, like he really knows. So when we hear that he doesn't know that he hasn't done this before, I am super, super curious whether or not this is supposed to be a purposeful thing that the writers wrote him to be somebody who kind of comes across as vaguely condescending, even though he himself does not know what he's doing, or if this is accidental and they just want him to seem really confident. And occasionally they show their hand by accident and they don't expect us to like judge him for this because the way he's sort of dismissive here and doesn't ask any questions, but just sort of assumes that like, Oh, well, you're just dealing with the normal. Like, no, it turns out that they were completely wrong about the person that she's taken over. They used social media as a means of discovering what someone was like and what their activities were so that they can, like, approximate activity um, when they talk to somebody later. And it turns out that whole Facebook page was an exercise that was between her and her social worker to set up a fake, like, identity and, and assist her in like using social media and, and talking about herself and whatnot. So all of this stuff that she cited was not even true. And the person whose body she's occupying has a debilitating illness that will lead to her death. Eventually, who knows how long that will take. She's kind of a ticking time bomb. So he's very like cavalier, like, well, you know, we knew this wasn't going to be easy. And it's like, yeah, did you didn't even ask her what she means though? Um, it's they're calm so they can all communicate. Ah, thank you, Huggabug. That's right. Because he's like really surprised that comms exist already. Um, McLaren, Trevor, Philip, Marcy, and Carly. Okay. So McLaren is the FBI agent. Trevor is the, uh, the high school kid. Philip is the one that's a, uh, heroin addict. Marcy is the girl with the disability and Carly is the one with the baby. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, thank you very much, Michael. Appreciated. So this kid, Trevor, comes across as a very sort of uh, literal dude. <laughs> he, at one point he says, it, you know, when he, when McLaren's like, it, we knew it was going to be a walk in the park. He says, actually, you should try a walk in the park sometime. It's lovely. And he says it with complete sincerity and no hint of irony whatsoever. And based on the way he interacted with his friend last episode and his friend's like, why'd you come to school? You have a free pass. And he's like, and fail to graduate the way he talks. It's like, he's a, a, a robot or somebody that like this, like language is not native to him or something, you know, I don't know, but, I find him really amusing and I am really, really looking forward to what's going to go on with him later. Like I've, the way that he takes everything and the way that he doesn't understand text speak and whatnot as well. Like you would really think in a future in which technology is, has advanced to a degree that we can literally send people back in time into somebody else's body. You would think that, are you okay as text speak would not be completely alien to him. And I assumed that it was because of the tech in his world, not being the same as ours. But now I'm starting to wonder if it's just because he doesn't have the experience with this sort of thing, because he strikes me as somebody who does not have either very many friends or even just so far as to say, doesn't have a lot of human interaction um, and I am absolutely dying to know more about who these people were and what got them involved in this whole thing. Like, there is so much about the backstory of all of this. Their missions are fascinating to me, but way more than that, they are fascinating to me as people before this whole thing starts, you know. 
Um, Michael says, yeah, but you have kids saying yeet nowadays. So I'm not surprised at all. I mean, yeet is a, is a nonsense word that means something that we don't really even need to use every day. But are you okay? All you have to do is literally say the letters outside, like just say them and you will start to hear the words that they line up with and be like, oh, but he doesn't do that. He just reads them as if they're a word. A ruach, right? I think is what he says. Something like that. Um, it's just, it's the the lack of ability to do something so basic is really interesting. And I don't know if it's telling or not. Um, so they are all talking about, you know, being able to communicate with each other and whether or not they are all set and ready to go. Um, Trevor says that he built the comms after school. So he's obviously like a savant of some kind. And a bunch of police are suddenly on the scene really unexpectedly having gotten word of something going on here. And it's, it was a little bit confusing to me. I will admit that we go right from the police swooping in on them all in this abandoned building to a cut of a truck outside of another building with a bunch of uh, workers and, and, you know, flashing lights and whatnot. I, for quite a bit, like another like five minutes, 10 minutes even maybe, thought that these were the same place in the same building and that they had accidentally walked in on some shit going on that was separate from what they were there for, that maybe this wasn't as abandoned a building as they had thought. Like the, it just, the way it's cut and, and the, you know, the fact that it's night as well. So there's no change in light or anything to really sort of indicate to me that this is at a different point. Um, it's all, it, it was a little bit confusing to me, even though they have, it says Van Hughes Corporation up on the top. It's in such small letters and it's, uh, I watch most of my shows with, um, subtitles on because I occasionally will mishear things. I find that subtitles really help with me trying to remember names of characters, things like that. So I was paying attention, I think, to those subtitles and didn't even notice these little letters up here telling me that we were like now in a different location. Um, and it wasn't until I started to like pay more attention to the clocks and them telling us, oh, this is the amount of time we have until such and such happens that I was like, oh, this is a different place. Oh, okay. Um, and it says, uh, first of all, Van Heusen Corporation. And then we see this like bizarre sort of reactor. And it says historical time of antimatter explosion. And we've got just under 47 minutes. I would like to repeat that. Historical time of antimatter explosion. Kids. What? I. What? Okay. We'll get to that. Um, and. We have uh, this woman, Delaney, and she is following around this guy who has obviously nothing but disdain for her. He is not hearing a word she says, even though she is a fucking expert in her field whom we find out invented this fucking thing. Like, it's just so cliche. It, and I don't mean cliche like the show is being cliche. I just mean it is very predictable for a man who does not know what the fuck he's talking about to dismiss a woman who is in at the top of her field with no thought whatsoever for the safety of anything. And she's trying to explain to him that their traveling with this thing is super dangerous, that it's going to be potentially volatile, that, you know, any sort of, of shaking and movement is going to cause some sort of rupture and he is like, well, any place that we can take it is better than here. He's behaving as if this is a safety issue. 
But she says that's bullshit and that you just want a new weapon and is clearly powerless to stop him from taking whatever it is that he is taking. And it's a pretty awful moment, like the the helplessness of it and her like talking to him. And she says, you just want a new weapon. And he literally doesn't even deign to answer her. He just walks the fuck away. And I was just like, "Ooh, I hate you. Um, so the cops that have arrived say you called in that you were in pursuit of a suspect. Do you need backup? And the way that she says this makes it seem to me that he, I'm pretty sure did not call for backup because why would he? And she is making up a story on the fly in order to explain why they're here. Um, and it turns out that she herself is also a traveler and that they had been meant to meet up with one another, like on the, on the road basically. And she is, the plans have changed. And as she puts it, uh, no plan survives the past, something like that. And tells him that he must be new here with the sort of smirk that as incredibly irritating as that smugness is it's usually earned <laughs> it's the kind of thing it's just like oh this is so obvious to me that i take it for granted and hearing you express doubt is just precious and i remember when i used to feel this way and sweetie it's gonna be hard and you're gonna have to learn um but yeah he explains to them about how he uh took out this suspect and his body is over here she says i'm traveler 3185 um, this is your containment unit. You can trust it. So yeah, no plan survives contact with the past. That's what she says. So the containment unit that she's, uh, giving him is some really advanced science that winds up kind of giving them away. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's not like they don't know that when they decide to do this, they know that this is going to be technology that people here have not encountered before but it's better to leave people totally puzzled and leave them technology that they can allegedly uh, hopefully dissect and replicate and thus advance themselves at a higher uh, at a faster pace than they might ordinarily have done than it is to just be worried about oh what if they find out what we're doing who's gonna believe it they don't need to really worry about that, you know? Um, so we go to these couple of SUVs and it says historical time of explosion. And it's like 14 minutes away. So some time has seriously passed and it turns out that this is them driving to this facility that we had seen earlier. There is a moon in this scene that I just can't handle I know that this is a small thing, guys. I wish that I could share a screenshot of this with you all right now. But it is distractingly fake. And I don't know why they even bothered. Just have it, you know. It's it's the size of the SUV almost. And is just so low in the sky. The whole thing is just weird to me. Um, but yeah. they He pulls over for a moment because they have to bide a little bit of time. And wait for the truck to pass them by. And this is when we have the conversation between McLaren and Carly. And it turns out that they are in a relationship and know each other quite well. And uh, she picked the body that he went into because there had been another option who was apparently somebody very unattractive. And he is really grateful that she is that she did not pick that person. Um, but we get the sense because he says, I hope you like older men that he is actually yo like he's younger than the host body that he is in right now, technically. And when she was looking at him weirdly in the last episode and he asks if everything's okay. And she's like, I was just trying to figure out if you were asking me out. Now we get a little explanation that at the time of him coming to the door, she wasn't even sure that this dude McLaren wasn't already taken over because he did act similarly enough to the guy that she knows 
that it could be him, you know, and she says that he was actually like very charming and whatnot. And I sort of like the fact that he bristles that she's like, oh, really? He was charming? Well, what the fuck, you know? Um, But the idea of both like she is in a situation where her host was single, technically, like she's got this guy in her life, but he's not living with her. And it's pretty obvious that she can like have him not be a part of her life and it won't, it won't affect what's going on between her and McLaren. McLaren though is married and he's married to like a super hot babe who is very happy with him and very affectionate and very much like wanting to be, be relationshipy with him. So I am waiting for the conflict that arises inevitably when he either sleeps with this woman or doesn't sleep with this woman. Either way, he's kind of screwed. Like, I wonder what kind of rules there are for this. If he is allowed to sleep with her, does his partner know? Does he have an obligation to tell her? Is that something that, like... You know, because it's technically rape. She's sleeping with somebody and it's not the person that she thinks she's sleeping with. But also, like, he can't give himself away by suddenly behaving totally differently. At the same time, he's not giving himself away because, again, who is going to believe it? She's just going to figure his personality is starting to change, which is a shame because she is going to start to watch her marriage like fall apart and she won't understand why and what's happened to this man that she thought she knew and loved who's acting totally differently towards her all of a sudden. But is that less painful than like thinking that he's dead, which is she, he would have died, you know, that's what would have happened if they hadn't taken him over. So is this kind of closure better than a sudden death? I don't know. Um, but anyway, there's just so much. There's so much. My mind goes in a lot of directions, y'all. Um, so we see them, uh, the the other group with um, Marcy and uh, Philip and whatnot, they're all in a separate area also watching this convoy go by. And inside, there is a man who is talking to the major and he says, the containment unit, it's failing. And he looks at him and is just like, what? With total shock. Like, this bitch didn't just fucking tell you five minutes ago, you dumb fuck. And he says, we are detecting micro annihilations. So she was right. I wouldn't say that, sir. Uh, but we won't make it to our facility. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Why wouldn't you say that? Why wouldn't you say that, though? She was. You shits. I hate you. We're looking at an explosion in the megaton range, they say. So he says to stop the convoy. Um, I want everyone to turn around and get as far away from here as fast as you can. And is basically like this is going to happen. And he comes up to the dude who's driving the truck and says I'm going to be following just behind and tells him to take it as far as he can this guy is lying and telling this dude that he is behind him and letting him go on alone to get this thing out of range of him and his buddies and sacrificing this dude to die he is absolute garbage and I want to rip his throat open and dance in his blood. I hate him. 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 I hate him so much. There are so many villains out there that I just sort of am like, oh, yeah, you're so evil. Whatever. Ugh. But this dude really just gets to me in a way it's like he embodies so much of what I hate about the world, you know, dismissive of a woman that is an expert, totally does not give a shit about the potential lives about to be lost and is treating them as if they are disposable in a way that's like they are not even a person and shameless about how open 
he is with his like partner who comes up to him and is like, you're not following him. I say partner, more like assistant. And the fact that his assistant is continuing to like work with him and obey him on this. And also, I mean, I assume that the assistant, if he tried to quit, he'd just be killed because he knows way too much. Right. But I also really despise a person who is willing to help out somebody who does this kind of work and does things like this. Let somebody literally drive off to their death without a fucking word. And I am just disgusted. I hate him. Oh, so this dude is heading off on his own and um, they are, you know, they're waiting for their moment to swoop in. So they come across the, uh, I think they're that she and him are in a spot that's like almost in the middle of the road. So when this truck comes up, um, he is forced to stop versus the others who are like sitting off to the side and actually watch it drive by. And when she stands in the road in front of this guy, um, he is telling her that she does not want to be here, that she needs to get out of the way. And it's pretty obvious from the way that she is standing that she has a mission here. But and and I get the sense that he knows that. He's saying something like, You don't want to be here, lady. And but he also calls for help and says, Sir, I could use some help here, not realizing, of course, that he is abandoned by now. Um, but there's something about the way he says I could use some help here that makes me think he can see from the way she's standing that she is not somebody to be fucked with. And we find out like a little bit later when we see her, we already knew she wasn't from the way she handily took out her partner. But this bitch has training and is maybe military. Like, I don't know what her deal is, but she is intense and I kind of want to be her. I kind of like... I'm just so not this type of person, but there's a part of me that wishes I could be, and I'm not even sure I'm capable of getting there. But anyway, he leans out to like yell at her and Carly comes up behind him and doses him with something to knock him out. And they all swoop in and get the containment unit that they have. That's much more modern and much more capable and scoop up this antimatter and get it transferred into that unit. And the, even though the tech that they have for the containment unit that they are using is much more advanced, it's still not like a permanent solution. We find out that this uh, unit is actually, there's a, a countdown before it blows anyway. So even though it's better, it's still like, it, it, it's not something that they can just like leave it, you know? Um, so they gather it all up. They dose the guy with something else that I guess is going to wake him. Um, and then they get into their cars and they head the fuck out and they need an excuse to get back into the facility because they're trying to figure out what the hell they're going to do with this thing. They had a plan and y'all that shit does not work out. I'll get to that in a second. We have a pretty sweet scene where Marcy goes back to the apartment that she's staying in with her social worker, who, as this episode progresses, becomes more and more aware that something is really off about all of this. Um, he tells her, like, when she finally... She sort of says that she's working for the FBI, basically, because he says a guy named McLaren came to see me and she's like, would it help if I told you I worked with him? And he's like, yeah, it would actually, that would explain a lot. Um, but you know, obviously she's leaving out plenty. And by just saying I work with him, she's letting him think she's FBI and sort of undercover and has been, and there's no real way for her to explain what has happened to the woman who was in the body that she is in now? Um, 
I uh, I really like this dude and I like kind of ship them. But also I feel like I don't like it feels so clear that they are all constantly in such danger. And I just he is such a sweet little cinnamon roll and so sort of clueless that I just don't want him in the path of any of this. Does that make sense? Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah. The explosion goes up, but it's like the explosion of a much smaller size. There's some, there's a whole other thing that goes that does not include the antimatter. They think that the guy driving the truck is a piece of history that they couldn't change. But unfortunately, the guy driving the truck, and I won't say unfortunately, really, with sincerity, because good for him, he survived. But he also saw faces pretty clearly. And I can't help but think that this is going to come back and bite them in the ass. He at the, the very least saw Carly's face. You know, I'm pretty sure Marcy completely caught him off guard and he didn't get a chance to spot her. And I don't know if he saw McLaren's face or not, because McLaren was sitting in the car behind her. But, you know, it's not like he was wearing even a pair of sunglasses or anything. He was just sitting in a car. He might have been able to see his face pretty clearly, too. Um, but, yeah, that just throws a wrench in things like that. I don't think they're ready for. Um so this conversation that she has with her social worker, uh, it's like he f asks her at one point, too, why she's staying with him. And she sort of is like, listen, I feel like eventually I'm going to need your help. But if that's not OK, I can find somewhere else to say to stay. And he really quickly is like, no, 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 it's fine. Stay here. But I am not sure if this is a good idea. Like I said, I'm just worried about this guy. When she comes back to the apartment, he's like practicing guitar and there's all these candles lit and everything. It's just really clear that he is a sensitive man with, you know, he's just just be nice to him, Marcy. There's going to come a time when I'm going to need your help. Uh, and she, the way she says it, it feels like specifically his help for whatever reason. And the way she's looking at it makes me really worry that that help is going to result in his death eventually. And that she is like aware of that. And I can't tell you how much I hate all of this. So we have uh, the moment where McLaren has to drop Carly off and they're looking at each other with this expression because they have to separate here and go on with the lives that their hosts had. And it's painful. It's a hard thing to do. And what's sort of funny here is that she kisses him and like earlier in the day, her husband, partner, I don't even know what to call this guy, her ex, I'm just going to call him her ex, saw McLaren at her door and assumed that something was going on and like got in her face because of it and nothing was going on. But then if he sees them now, it is because McLaren's literally somebody else at this point. So she gets home she thinks that the babysitter's home with her child. And when she gets in, there is a note that's left. And it says, um, sent the babysitter home. I have Jeffrey Jr. We need to talk. And I am extremely interested in what the fuck is going to happen to this guy. And she has a reaction. And it's... <laughs> I want to know what kind of attachment she has to this child. I feel like she doesn't have one. I feel like taking over a host's body, you are completely yourself in their body. There is no vestigial memory. There are no vestigial emotions. It's just you. And I 
don't know if she has ever raised a child. I don't know if she has any sort of maternal instinct. Like, I'm I'm trying to imagine myself being put into her body. And I feel like I have enough of an impulse to like care for people that I could manage, but it would be pretty tough, especially when I don't really have a personal connection to the baby and I don't like, it's not mine. Um, and I don't know if she is that way or if she could, you know, it seems like she tries to get a babysitter every chance she gets, which I don't blame her for. It's not her kid and she has shit to do. Um, but yeah. And, and then we have um, Trevor who goes home and he like, I think walks in on his mom drawing a bath and he just like sneaks past her back to his own room and tries not to draw attention to himself. I I don't believe that she thinks he's home because his door is open. His bedroom door is open, but he just doesn't want to talk to her. Um, and then we have uh, McLaren coming home and it's fun. You know, he like walks into this house that he's never been in before. He's supposed to know the layout of stuff, but he almost like knocks a lamp over and it's a really beautiful home. Like it really, there's this big, uh, brick fireplace and the decorating is just spectacular. It's not like my style at all, but it's totally like, a, you know, what's her name that does that, uh, ship lap. It's, it's got her kind of vibe to it, like a urban country sort of thing. And he winds up just sitting on the couch. There's all these candles lit. I think because his wife was expecting him home, but I'm not positive. And he winds up just sitting down on the couch and like passing out. And he's still there in the morning when she comes downstairs. Um, meanwhile, poor Philip is over here staring at this, uh, pack of drugs that that dude gave him to and kind of like trying to fight a craving to do something and we find out later that it's really like interfering with his work you know the the way that he is shaking and stuff from detoxing he has to continue to use in order to feel normal because they don't have time for him to fucking detox right now so I really feel for him that he's coping with that. That's a lot. Everybody's got their own particular sort of uh, issue that they are dealing with and having to cope with that is very specific. Because McLaren's situation, one could say, seems like an ideal one. He's put in a body of a fit, attractive man who lives in a beautiful home with his beautiful wife and on the surface this is like just about as good as it's gonna get but he's in love with somebody else you know and and it just ruins it all for him also she makes coffee for him and there's cow's milk in it and he was not ready i don't know what he's been drinking i don't know what food in the future is like i'm i would love to know more about how different and how much of a culture shock it is to go back but yeah this whole thing is just um like the the morning routine that they all have to go through. I really like getting to see that, you know, we have him with this. We have Trevor being like woken up by his mom and he's in a bedroom that's full of all of these posters of half naked chicks all over the place. And it's just so cliche. Um, and we have, uh, what's her face? Carly, who is, I think like, eating yogurt and, and she's doing like crunches and workouts and has weights and everything. I think it's baby food. That's what it is. Cause there's like a few jars of it, which makes me wonder like what did, she didn't have time to go shopping. I'm assuming. So maybe this was like the only halfway healthy food in the entire house was baby food. Um, but yeah, she seems to be like frustrated with the body that she's in. You know, like she wants, she says something to him about how this one's a little too soft, unless you like that. And he's like, mm, I'm not answering that question either way. But I feel like she's sort of, I, how great would that be if you could invite a traveler into your body temporarily and they could do all the work and get you into like amazing shape 
And you could come back into your body in tip top shape and enjoy it for like a couple of weeks until you inevitably ruin it. I would pay good money for that. I'm telling you what, I don't have to do the work myself. I don't have to focus like that. I don't have to like slave away. And then I get to come back into the results. Sign me the fuck up. Yes, please. Um, and meanwhile, poor Philip is just sweating and just having a really hard time. Again, trying to get through this, but there is no way around what happens to you. You have to use at least a little bit to be able to be normal again. And I hate this. Like the, it's a really compelling thing because this is an addiction that is physical. You know, they can't, you can't come into this and be like, I don't even like heroin. I'm not doing it. Done. You know, like that's not how it works. That this body has some shit happening that you walked into and now you've got to cope with that and figure it out. Um, so we have the conversation between Marcy. What is her social worker's name again? Is it David? I think it's David. Um, and he is, he wants her to have a cell phone that he got for somebody um, and he's giving it to her. He has the number and he's basically like, if it rings, I'm literally the only person who has has the number. So it will be me. And she takes the phone and leaves. And later on, he winds up calling her at a pretty inopportune moment and overhears her having to administer CPR to Philip. Because Philip, for some reason, doesn't want to admit to all of them that he's going through DTs. And I don't really know why not. Like, he definitely had like everybody is aware of what the cause of death of his host was going to be. Right. So why hide this? I'm not really sure what his goal is there. It feels like he's ashamed, but that has, it has nothing to do with him. You know, I don't really understand that. Um, so it turns out that um, him and Marcy are supposed to go uh, meet with this traveler that is going to be taking over the body of a dude um, who is going to have, I think, a contact for them that they can use to hand over the containment unit that they're using. And this dude is about to commit suicide. And they have a recorded cause of death which is a gunshot wound because the guy uses a gun in his mouth to commit suicide. But the traveler comes into his body just before he can pull the trigger and takes his body over. And they think, okay, so far so good. But it turns out they don't have all of the information. This dude also took a dose of, I think they said it was fentanyl. And like drank it down with bourbon or something. So this dude had a backup plan, which nobody checked for. Because like in, in the autopsy, cause of death, clearly self-inflicted gunshot wound. They're not also going to be doing toxicology reports on his blood. They don't need to know anything else. The guy killed himself with a gun. That's it. And so it sl slipped right past their information nets that the guy also took a drug so she and uh, and Philip walk in ready to meet with this dude and he fucking collapses and dies anyway because of the drug, which they were not fucking ready for. And now they have to wait and hope that there is another body somewhere of somebody who's going to die from preventable causes that the traveler that was gonna end up in that dude's body can use instead. And they don't have anybody like that. There's not really anybody like, you know, and Philip, it turns out, memorized all of the deaths in this area for the duration of their mission. So they can just ask him who's going to be coming up, but there's like, not anybody soon enough or close by enough. Um, and yeah, they're talking about the director probably didn't know about the pills, um, a fail safe in case he lacked the uh, courage to pull the trigger. So there wasn't anyone from his team to meet to meet us. Nope. And we looked all over the place. 
So, yeah, they don't know what to do because they have not been prepared for this sort of setback. The setbacks that they are all ready for are external, not that a traveler can't come through. You know, coping with outside shit is a very different thing because there it's all just going to be small changes and alterations to a history that they know about already because it's on record, you know, um, or they think they know about it. At the very least, if the records are accurate. So. Wh- like, basically, McLaren decides that he's going to go out and like try and seek out some other travelers and ask for their advice. And the one other traveler that he, we see him talk to has no mercy at all. She is basically like, this shit is hard. The job takes a lot of like thinking on your feet. You're going to need to figure this out. There is nothing that I can do. I don't have an alternative for you. I don't have any way to contact anybody. And they did not give me the information that you were going to need. So talking to me is not going to help you. I am not supposed to know everything. You are not supposed to know everything. The whole point of doing things this way is that we work as a network and have to depend on one another to get the whole thing done. And, you know, it's it's just a, a lot of pressure. I feel bad for him because he's doing his best, but he just doesn't, like, he's out here, you know, completely alone with no home base to reach out to because of the way this all works. Um, so we have the major calling Delaney and he thinks that she screwed him because the material that he thought was in the containment unit is obviously not there because our team came in and scooped it out. But when he calls and he's like, there was an explosion, um, Of course, she assumes the worst, but he tells her it wasn't even that bad. And it it was just the truck. And and he thinks that she ripped him off and held on to whatever it was that she was using and studying. And it's understandable why he would think that. She's putting up quite a fight in him taking it in the first place. Um, But, you know, he's just... I hate this guy. He's going to be a fucking pain in the ass. Um, so Philip, uh, I'm forgetting exactly what it was he was working on when he like, cause he shorts something out. Um, and that causes them to, it, it causes the amount of time that the containment unit has, I think, to significantly drop. If that's, does that sound right? Um, I'm trying to think, let's see, FBI business, yada, yada. This is the call with David. Um, I think he shorted out the circuit and he's going into cardiac arrest. Marcy is doing her thing. And uh, we have Trevor who's looking over like whatever work Philip was doing and has this expression on his face like, oh, fuck. Um, I'm trying I'm trying to find the piece of dialogue where he says exactly what has happened here. I don't know let's see speak up Trevor. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay. Uh we didn't add time. Um we lost it and there's not much left. Ooh. Okay. So I don't understand what happened then. I don't know what he was trying to do. And maybe I'm not supposed to. Is this supposed to be the tool for them to get back? I don't think so. Or add time to how how long this containment unit is supposed to last? I I guess right because it had said they said forty hours the night before, um, in total. Oh, he was trying to. Okay, <laughs> Michael says I don't remember the plot of this episode at all. They were trying to extend the time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so this amps up exactly how mu- how quickly they have to figure out what the fuck is going on. Philip is still like lying to everybody about the fact that he's experiencing the DTs. I just wish I knew why he would. And uh, then we have the scene where they have to fake their way 
into the facility where the dark matter was created or discovered or distilled or whatever you want to call it. So they cause an artificial flood by remotely unlocking these like basically valves and then pretending to be a plumbing unit that's coming in. Only Delaney is not a fucking dum-dum and she is aware that this was done remotely and she fucking completely calls them out on it and it's just like so what are you fucking doing here and i love that delaney knows very well that somebody is trying to fuck with her shit she is no fool and i i've also found it very fascinating on the drive how mclaren is talking to carly and she says something about like delaney being a piece of shit basically she created the most destructive weapon in history and McLaren is just like, dude, no, the military completely put all of their shit on her shoulders in the history books and everybody has bought it. And she says, I've seen her in those history docs. The woman's got all the charm of a foaming yeast vat, which was a really weird way to say that, but okay. But yeah, I, uh, you know, I can understand holding somebody accountable, but we can see clearly This isn't what Delaney intended. This was not supposed to be a weapon. She was doing research for dark matter for something else. And they just decided to fucking swoop in and take it. So that sucks. Um, So they have to try and explain to her what the fuck there is going on. She has McLaren at gunpoint, but behind her is Marcy, who is holding Delaney at gunpoint. So it's a standoff for a minute. And finally, she believes them that they are trying to help her out. And the major shows up. And there comes a point where it's about to be like, we're going to have to kill the major. We're going to have to take this guy out because this unit is about to blow up and we are going to all die. And this is going to be a massive explosion unless we kill this one dude. But she decides to lie and tell him that, the dark matter wasn't actually real that she falsified documents and, and results of her experiments to tell him because she needed funding that it was working. And this is really interesting because it means that not only did they keep this one explosion from happening, but they have potentially kept the military from getting involved in her project at all again, or they have prevented her from continuing to get the funding that she would need to make additional mistakes. One might say, um, so this moment is, is a pretty big one potentially, you know, and It all kind of depends on whether or not he believes her and whether he decides to leave this alone or what. Um, So they are able to transfer the material into the proper unit. She, again, is very aware of the fact that this technology does not yet exist. And when she demands of McLaren, like, what the fuck is going on here? Who are you? Where did you get this tech? And he tries to say the FBI. She's just like, yeah, no, I'm not buying that you're from the FBI. Get the fuck out of here. And he gives her his card. And he's like, if you need help, you can call me. I'll probably be calling you first. Um, And he tells her, you saved the major's life. And she's just like, ah, oh, shit. <sighs> You could have killed the guy and just like gotten him out of my, damn it. I should have just let you, which I found very amusing. And then we get another montage of the, and it says building 26 is focused on very specifically at the end there. And I don't know if that means anything, but then we get this amazing sequence. First of all, of Trevor trying to ride his bike home and he is not good at it. Um, The house that he pulls up to is really something too, guys. It's a, it's a, classic like new england style looking clabbered house that i would see on like the shorelines in old saybrick or somewhere and he's acting really weird and he didn't go to class and his mom sort of is like resigned that the nice boy that was around for one day is apparently gone 
I feel bad for his mom because she just seems so disappointed in the son in the son that she raised and also in herself that like this is what she made because she seems aware that he sucks. Um, we have uh, Marcy and she's getting home and has this uh, moment with David where he's making tea and just being like the sweetest in the entire world. Guys, can I just tell you how much I love this like trope of the woman who's constantly worrying about her secret agent boyfriend or whatever, and making a beautiful home and taking care of the kids being inverted and it being this like sweet little soft boy who makes tea and wears flannel. Um, I just really, really enjoy that. Um, and then we have, let's see. Oh, there's the, uh, Carly getting home and getting the baby from the babysitter. And we don't see her ex in this, so I don't know what's going on with that. But the way that she behaves with the baby clearly having a dirty diaper, she is not excited about this. It seems like she knows what to do, but I don't get the feeling this is something that she's happy about having this responsibility. And then McLaren comes home and his wife is super excited that he's home already and wants to like go pour some wine and have a like lovely evening together. It's really honestly very, very sweet. And there's a knock on the door and it's this little girl acting real creepy. Traveler 3468, mission outcome acceptable in light of extenuating factors. Further breach of protocols may result in punitive action. End of message. And it's this little Girl Scout who's trying to sell cookies door to door. And she looks totally startled when she finishes her message and is not able to recall why she's standing here. I guess they must use kids like maybe their brains aren't fully developed yet. And so it's easier to like get in there and send messages or maybe they don't, just like, haven't built their defenses up quite as much. But in any case, his he's like about to buy some cookies from her and his wife comes to the door and is like, sweetie, you already did this side of the street. I just bought two boxes from you like half an hour ago. And it's a weird little moment of this poor girl looking really confused and, and like distressed. The actress is actually very good, um, this little girl. And they close the door on her. And the end of the episode is basically her just telling her husband, so how was your day? And he says, you know what? My day was boring. I'd rather hear about yours. Tell me everything. Because he's trying to learn as much as he can about her. But it's one of those moments that like, if you have been in a relationship for a while and somebody just straight up is like, tell me everything about your day and genuinely seems to be like listening and paying attention and looking at you, it's kind of touching because it's so easy to get used to each other. So I really liked this in like the, that light, you know, of her just being like, oh, my husband's home early and he wants me to talk about my day. Like, I don't know. This is sort of sweet, even though I know he's in love with somebody else. Details, details. Um, anyway, I am way over time, but, um, thank you, Michael, for commissioning this. And thank you guys for hanging out in the chat with me and helping me out with names and what was going on and stuff. Um, and I hope you're enjoying the coverage and I will see you soon, hopefully with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcast.